Hello. I'm delighted today to be back again with my friends, Dr. Tima Tastaha and Lance Schuttler for the second in our series in optimizing health and happiness for humans and animals. Now, the first episode, we discussed what is health and how can we optimize it? And we're following up in this second episode where we discuss what is happiness we look at the scientific, physical, spiritual, philosophical aspects of happiness. And as always, we're always keen to apply our discussions to animals too. I absolutely loved the different perspectives that Lance and Timo brought to this discussion. And I hope you do too. So please sit back, enjoy the episode, and please do let us know in the comments or the reviews what resonates with you. Thank you. Right, I am delighted to be here for the second in our series on optimizing health and happiness for humans and animals. And once again, I'm going to introduce you to my two special guests for this episode. So first of all, in the left-hand corner, we have Dr. Timo Tastanar. And Timo is a veterinarian, I have to read this. You've got quite a long bio, Timo. Um, a veterinarian, a doctoral degree in equine cardiology. Timo's worked extensively in equine and pet food and supplement production, animal physiology and movement. Um, you're also involved in pet food formulation and consultation for various companies. And you're mainly known for your ability to break down very complex scientific data um, and explain to the general public. So we're going to be testing you on your ability for that today. And like Lance and I, he very much prefers natural solutions as much as possible, prioritising long-term functional solutions over short-term benefits. And with just, side effects. Uh, yeah, exactly, with terrible side effects. And in the bottom corner, we've got my dear friend, Lance Shuttler. So Lance graduated from the University of Iowa with a bachelor's degree in health science and is a CNO, CEO and owner of Ascent Nutrition. And both Timo and I love that company and your products, Lance. Um, and Ascent Nutrition is a holistic nutrition company. You're a contributing health and wellness writer at the Epoch Times, and your work includes the topic of regenerative agriculture, resource-based economies, and quantum technologies. And for those of you that haven't met me, I'm a biologist and a holistic health practitioner for humans and animals. And like Lance and Timo, I'm passionate at looking at the root cause of physical, emotional, spiritual issues and looking at, at how we put those right so we optimize health and happiness for humans and their animals. So last week, both of you, we had a lovely discussion on what is health. And this week, we're talking about what is happiness. So I'm going to go straight in with you, Lance. What does happiness mean to you? Well, Catherine, that's a, a very uh, deep question, obviously. And, you know, a question that we all think about, whether it's conscious or unconscious, and how can we be happier? Um, to me, though, what happiness is, is true contentment in whatever one is doing, whether it's in a particular moment or contentment in someone's job, uh, you know, contentment in a relationship and peace within that, you know, really feeling that there's trust, there's um, happiness, uh, you know, that, that, that just sort of ties in where there's this knowing that all is well and like, not just from a conceptual standpoint, but a true deep knowing, knowing that everything actually is okay, whether it's again in this moment or whether it's something, if we're looking at a situation more long-term. And, you know, to me, happiness just is all of that, but also it's part of why we're here. We're, I believe, really meant to cultivate happiness and we're meant to enjoy our lives and do things that really do bring us that sort of satisfaction, contentment, peace, joy, love, all of those different uh, words and attributes, I think all really tie into what is happiness. And, you know, there's probably unlimited amounts of definitions of happiness. Uh, and, you know, like we talked about last time, if you would ask me this yesterday or tomorrow, I'd probably have a different answer. 
Um, but I think in general, that's how I view happiness and how I'm trying to cultivate happiness in my life. I love it. And what I love about this discussion is when we're looking at a question such as what is health, what is happiness, you know, there's a scientific aspect, there's a philosophical aspect, there's the spiritual aspect, there's the ancient wisdom aspect, there's so many different ways so we can all look at it. And Timo, I'm pretty sure that you'll be coming up with a different perspective. What's yeah, the sure. definition of happiness? For me, it's quite basic. Uh, my definition of happiness is want versus have the relationship between want and have so every person wants something in their life from basic reproduction needs to food to sunlight sunshine some cats just need a need a slight pet on the head some dogs like to be cuddled in their belly and um, this is want versus have if you have what you want and you keep wanting what you have, you're happy. If you don't have what you want and you never get what you want, you are unhappy. Or you will have what you want, but you keep wanting other things, then you are unhappy. That's about it. It's the, the ultimate contentment of, uh, of the moment. So people, that's why people who are more appreciative of what they have are mostly happier. Not important if they're poor, if they're extremely religious, if they are totally devout uh, in, uh, in whatever they're doing, if what they want aligns with what they have, they're happy. If what you want is not aligned with what you have, you are unhappy. For me, this is- We're gonna have a good debate about this one. For me, I was thinking a lot about this this morning. And for me, it's like happiness is a state of being unrelated to the wants in life it's a, an inside job of feeling and whereas I completely admit that um if there's something you set your eye on that's external to you and you get it that can cause a feeling of happiness I suppose it for me it's all about that feel uh, happiness is a, a, a state of mind and body and that it's um, a sensation almost that isn't really in its true sense dependent on anything of outside of you um, because I think we're going to have some quite interesting discussions about the difference between feeling happy and necessarily being happy. Yeah. So Lance, what, what does what Timo and I said, what does that raise up to you? So you know, I was reading something recently on studies that have been happening in relation to happiness. And there's, you know, so many different studies that have taken place. Uh, they've been crafted in different ways, carried out in different ways, analyzed in different ways. Uh, and one in particular was, uh, they, they basically said that happy and happiness is a term that's too vague. Okay. Yeah. And so what they wanted to really measure was something called subjective well-being. Okay, how do we self-perceive ourselves as uh, being happy? Are we happy? Are we very happy, pretty happy, not too happy, not happy at all? You know, all, all of that can be viewed as happiness, but it's a different scale. And so what they're looking at is how, how they're measuring subjective well-being was uh, genes, plus circumstances, plus habits, okay? And so really looking at our genetic makeup and then the circumstances that we're in, uh, you know, what is our life like? Do we have, you know, a good family members around us, good spouse, um, you know, a, a endless list of other things. And then how do we uh, perceive that, you know, and how, how are we actually building those habits into our life? So, um, you know, I think it's a really interesting perspective because if we can really self-analyze and look at what are our habits and are these habits contributing to our happiness? Are they contributing to these wants and needs that Timo was talking about or are they not? Um, what are our circumstances and how, how can we change them if we can? Um, I think all of that sort of ties into 
how we self-perceive happiness. If we feel like we are in control of our lives or mostly in control, I, I believe that that tends to lead to a greater state of happiness. And if we feel like everything's out of our control and if we have a, sort of a victim mindset or you know, this sort of poverty mindset around different things, not just money, uh, that certainly can lead to states of unhappiness. So um, you know, that's one way of looking at things Mm. as it relates to happiness i love the scientists when they get down to this nitty-gritty of trying to analyze something so abstract really in terms of doing it it's fascinating to see the different studies timo what about you what you, what's this raising in you yeah actually uh, i totally understand it because um if i mean we are animals included we are in different states of consciousness, right? So all organisms have a different state of consciousness. Even proteins, they pack, unpack according to what they need. Hard to believe, but even proteins have basic consciousness uh, depending on their environment. So happy for me is someone uh, who, a happy person is someone who has what he needs or wants at this moment and is totally con content with it so that he's like yes i'm happy i have it and i can live my life with it so this is happy for me this is happy if it if you go to a comedy show and you expect to laugh you laugh you get out and you're super happy if you go to a comedy show you don't want to laugh you will not laugh and you will not live happy so it's always against what you want what you need and what you feel about it. So if if these things uh, align, you are happy. For me, I if I can make it as mathematical as possible, that would be it. Of course, I understand you that the happiness comes from inside. That is true, because you choose you choose to want to not give a flying leap, right? So it's like you decide not to. You you decide to just let everything else lay and you do what you want, you feel how you want. And this is, again, the ratio totally fits into happiness because what you want, you have. You, you have the freedom of not caring. You have the freedom of doing what you want. You are not hungry. You are not cold. You don't have water maybe today, but it will change. And, <laughs> and this is what makes you happy because you can do, you can exist the way you want. I think maybe this is the code for happiness your existence according to how you feel uh, is right or your existence of in line with how you feel. If your existence right now is not fitting to your feeling of how you want to exist, then I think you are unhappy. But there is a trick to it and that's called religion. So if your life is really bad and everything is bad, but you're totally, totally sure that the next one will be the best, then you might still be happy of going that direction. So, but for everyone else, uh, if you think that this is the only life you have and it doesn't fit what you want and you feel miserable, then you are unhappy. So I've got a question for you both. Um, so if we talk about, let's talk about humans for the moment. We can come on to animals for a moment. But if we talk about us weird and wonderful humans, um, if we look at alignment with core values, so most humans are consciously or unconsciously have got a set of core values that are really important to them about how they live their life. And I think we spoke a bit last week about how, you know, at the end of the day, we can be very good at fooling other people. But when you lie in bed at night, you're, you're there with yourself and yeah. your conscience and your real feelings about things. So you could achieve. And I know, Timo, you weren't talking about just achieving possessions. It was more like uh, yes. achieving contentment almost yes. is what I got out of that. But how much do you think that... Um, being in alignment and living in alignment with your core values, regardless of the external circumstances, can create internal happiness, Lance? Um, I think an immense amount, because I, I really believe that um, 
you know, like you've said a couple of times now, happiness is an inside job and we have to self-create it. Now, of course, outside circumstances uh, can contribute to that happiness. You know, having the possessions that we need, a safe, secure home, a beautiful dog behind you, um, you know, having loved ones, you know, all these external things, that, that's great. And, you know, we we have to put in work sometimes to actually create them or bring them into our lives. And at the same time, you know, me personally, um, you know, I can think back to just some, some very beautiful moments that I've had where I felt very, very happy. And, you know, one was, I was watching this unbelievably beautiful sunset in front of the Eiffel tower with a couple of good friends. And this was about 10 years ago. And I just, really was taking it all in and you know there's a lot of of course the the visual beauty of it but the the satisfaction and the the contentment truly that i was feeling of everything is okay right now and, and actually everything's more than okay everything's amazing and you know kind of going into the values aspect um i believe that when we really uh, are acting in accordance with what we call, you know, our intuition, our conscious mind, our higher self, our soul, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it, uh, the, the the deeper aspect of who we are. When we know that we're in alignment with that, and we're we're acting in alignment with that, we're speaking in alignment with that. I feel like that creates just such a deep resonance within ourselves that we just feel and we know that this is right for us and that this is you know me carrying out my values and is contributing to something that's greater than myself and that that can elicit the feelings of happiness mm, i love it i love all that Timo. but i have to laugh shortly because there is something called the paris syndrome uh it's seen mostly of the japanese who went to paris and get totally totally disappointed <laughs> and not, <laughs> not fulfilling what you expected. I'm not joking. This is a psychological issue. It's called Paris syndrome. <laughs> yeah. I so, had that in New York, Timo. I went to New York and I hated it. Sorry, New York, but I really was not happy there. <laughs> so. you, you prefer the old York, the original one, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Not too far away from you. So uh, I totally agree. Um, it, it's really, um, you can see that a lot of very happy people have nothing, no possessions. Mm -hmm. And that has nothing to do for, because the value for them has nothing to do with the worldly possession. And if you can erase all that, you're happy already because you are not yearning or you are not just wanting all the time. Maybe the, the biggest problem I see in the current gener generation or today's world is just being pushed to want all the time. Yeah. So, and I think that this is the, maybe this is the, the mass uh, unhappiness is because we constantly think about owning. And I'm not, I'm not just thinking about material things. Like if you look at Instagram, the constant wish for being liked mm -hmm. and it's just amazing. It's like, I'm seeing constantly people uh, taking pictures of themselves instead in front of something. Uh, just to show that they were somewhere special so people can click on it. I mean, who makes their own happiness dependent on other people's clicks on, a, on an app? It's just, this shows that how wrong we are right now and how um, far away we are from being happy. Do you know As that, a species, right? That's such a good point because I, um, I spent about eight years ago, I spoke, was lucky enough to spend some time at an elephant orphanage in Zambia. And the people, a lot of the people that were working there, it was just so wonderful interacting and speaking to them. So they had very, very little. They were seriously the happiest people I met. Now, how did I judge that? I judged that by their energy their calmness, their smiles, their complete lack of moaning about anything. Um, and also you could see, so this happiness wasn't like an excited happiness. It was more what I would probably decide as a, a content, peaceful happiness. And that resonated because when you see the way the animals responded to them, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. 
and um, they were living far more simple lives than most of us do who are going to be watching this podcast. And it was such a life lesson in terms of, you know, it's not about your house. It's not about, and I know we say these things, but when you really see that someone that's walking a couple of hours to work each day, arriving immaculate in shoes that don't fit them, doing very hard physical work, and constantly with a smile on her face and gratitude. I suppose it was this inner feeling of gratitude that they didn't need um, to express. And also the other thing which really stood out actually, now I'm talking about it, that I'd like both your opinion on, was this contentment with themselves. So, so not needing to be anything other than they are. Yeah. It's a huge impact on happiness, tying into what you were just saying. Um, you know, how much of us in our modern world now, I mean, Tima and I were young enough to grow up without social, old enough to grow up without social media. What a blessing that was. You yeah, know, sure. There was no photographic evidence of what we got up to in our teenage years. It was fantastic. <laughs> so, you know, this is a, a real issue, isn't it? Is about, can you be happy if you haven't accepted yourself as you are? Absolutely. And, you know, going along with what you're talking about with the social media, you know, I remember in my life, things really started when I was in sixth grade. Uh, MSN Messenger became a thing where you can start messaging people. And, you know, I think video came maybe a couple of years after that. Um, but, it, you know, it was, it was wonderful because it was great to be able to talk with friends instantly and, and all that. But we've seen it taken to the extreme where these algorithms are built to uh, ensure that dopamine is continually released within the brain and that we become addicted to it. And, you know, there might be malicious intent to that. There's certainly a financial incentive to it. You know, these are companies too. They need to make their money and they know how to do it. You keep people on the apps, keep them engaged, and you do that by giving them dopamine. And mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there's a lot of new ways that they've been doing it and new ways that they're trying to do it. Um, and, and I think at the same time, it's uh, a topic where or it ties into the, the, the concept and the story of things aren't good or bad in and of themselves. It's how we perceive them and how we use them and how we uh, are, you know, emotionally or physically tied to them, you know, because some people can use social media for the purpose that it is of, let's say, business use or just connecting with friends and family, and they're not looking for the dopamine hit, and, and they consciously are aware of that. Uh, but others are needing that hit of dopamine upon awaking, and that's where it's very destructive and creates this false sense of happiness and this false sense of inflated ego and all those sorts of things. Yeah, that ties to self-assessment problem, right? So, if, I mean, I was on stage a lot of times. I played live music very long, and I really liked to be on stage and people cheering for me, even throwing me underwear. I really loved it. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> for the female ones, at least. But, um, <laughs> but the, the, the problem is, if, if you can only exist in front of other people, and when you're alone, you're not happy, not even un, I'm not talking about not happy, but unhappy. Like then you go commit suicide, right? So th this is the typical problem of of the stardom because if if you feel neglected or if you feel like unhappy with yourself, who you are, then um, nothing can save you. That's why people who have nothing and want nothing cannot be happier because this is uh, yeah if half of your song is about a woman that you can never marry and uh, everybody's cheering you up, but uh, you cannot marry. So what's the point of living for this person when the whole life is depending on that one song? So you are totally right about it. And, and the craziest part is with the dopamine, women, most of the women are not dopamine based animals. So they are mostly serotonin based animals. So what happens is, um, you making these people more and more and more and more functioning in a way they cannot be happy with. So 
that's why women seek chocolate. So chocolate is ma what makes them happy because it just triggers something that the, uh, that yeah levels the hormones for their happiness. Males are different. We need dopamine. We need to achieve stuff, build stuff, break stuff, uh, success. And this, this is a very male trait. I'm not going to try to discuss about gender roles or something. I'm just saying that men are more like physically more, uh, more dependent on dopamine, mm. but women aren't. So when you're constantly triggering women in, with their dopamine, you are creating a lot of unhappy people constantly searching for something on the wrong direction because that more dopamine will not make you happier. So, right? We were talking about uh, subconsciousness and subconscious mind and how it's triggered. Last time we talked about it too, about health. With happiness, it's even bigger problem because your environment constantly telling you what to do, which doesn't align with who you are. It's, it's just, you cannot be happy as long as you are not aware that your programming from outside, the input, the impulse, everything that comes from outside do not align with your true nature. Mm. If, you, if you realize that, then your needs and wants change on a conscious level then you can start to look at things differently and drop the app and see that, okay, so what makes me happy? I want to work with wood. What makes me happy? I want to run a marathon, maybe. What makes me happy? I want to go outside and take some pictures. What makes me happy? I meditate. I don't know. But things that are not look good on Instagram. <laughs> things that are only good for you, right? Doesn't have to be anything connected to anyone else so it has to be connected to you and you have to feel like it's you yeah That's so, so so important and I think this comes back to what you were mentioning as well Lance about the ego and last week in our podcast anyone wanting to listen to that please go back to our what is health podcast um but we were talking about the importance about when, as humans, we lost con this connection of the fact that we are all part of nature, that we are connected to, whether you want to call it the divine matrix or whatever, and also the effect that that has on our microbiome. And we know that the microbiome and your physical health has a huge impact in the way that our bodies work and hence our, our feeling or ability to feel happy. Do you want to chime in on that one, Timo, first? Yeah, it's not just the effect on it. It's in total interaction constantly. And um, I wanted to tell you about this before, but um, certain people uh, might have... Uh, an unhealthy attraction towards minors when they are um, when they are uh, deficient on certain vitamin groups. Mm. Some people become really, really um, sociopathic when some vitamins and minerals are not in their system. And some people got to be suicidal when some of the vitamins and the minerals are not present. Right? So this is this is a constant, and most of the microbiome has a direct impact on what we eat, how we feel, how our immune system responds, uh, responds, right? And that's why it's super important. It's super important how we feel and how we live, how we eat, how we exercise. I mean, that also ties to something called the balance between uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline. So these are two adrenal cortex uh, hormones. And the difference between them is they both make us stronger and quicker and, and more like ready to act, ready for action. But one, the adrenaline one, is the one that creates stress. So that means it has an aftershock for the body in a negative way if it goes on for too long. And that is mostly more than three minutes. Because a fight or flight situation mostly is a three minute situation, right? And this is a, you can see it with horses, you can see it with other animals. And the noradrenaline one is more a positive thing because this is what a lion gets excited when it starts to rush to hunt down an animal. So this is the, the one with the success at the end, 
not with the, oh, if I'm going to die or survive, but more, oh, I'm going to eat. And this is a different type of excitement. And that excitement ends with, with a proper immune response, better health, better uh, happiness with the moment because you feel like you achieved something and you feel like you are able to achieve this. You are able to survive. You are able to dominate your life. And that is the that is that comes with noradrenaline. The problem is different types of animals, prey versus uh, predators, have different ratios. Mm. So a horse needs that adrenaline every day. Feel like has to run away to function properly. We are too. We need three times adrenaline versus one time noradrenaline. So that means we have to feel on our toes a bit, but we have to have our success too. So what these um, dopamine traps do to you is they constantly keep you on your toes without having actually a real success. Yeah. That means you have no real result of what you're doing. It's like coffee, right? It doesn't give you energy. You need another coffee when the first caffeine wears off. And it's exactly like that. It gives you something which is not real. And next time you seek more for it because you, you think that that might be actually it. But in return, actually sitting and looking at the sunset brings more happiness than getting 1 million likes on a funny video you posted over from your baby or something. Mm -hmm. That's my take. Yeah, it's absolutely fascinating, isn't it? And you can see how, um, without getting us into too much trouble, but you can see how easily a lot of this is to manipulate if you want to. Yes, and, and that's and, a big and problem. Control. And we've seen that on the food side of things and we're seeing that in this. Lance, what else do you want to bring up about happiness? So there's this phenomenon, uh, it's actually been studied called uh, the, the biological importance of awe. Uh, and this study was done and they were looking at people who would undergo states of awe. So like looking at a beautiful sunset, like Timo just said, watching a full moon rise, um, looking cat into- climbing a tree. <laughs> yes, cat oh. climbing trees. <laughs> Uh, just something that really induces a state of awe and like like true awe, you know, looking at stars where the whole night is lit up. So they're looking at humans who are doing this. Um, and I don't have all the details of the study, but essentially what they found was that after they went through this deep emotional and, and physical experience of, you know, seeing and witnessing this experience, this uh, whatever it was that they went through, uh, their levels of empathy went up, their levels of self-reported happiness went up, um, their, their cognition went up. So uh, not that their IQ went up, but that they started to perform better in work and life, um, their relationships improved. And, you know, I think that's just sort of anecdotal uh, piece of evidence showing that, you know, we're hardwired to take in the beauty of nature around us. You know, you were talking about this earlier, Catherine, and I mean, it's clear, we, we've all had these sorts of experiences, you know, to varying degrees. And we know that when we see something beautiful like that, when it's truly like, it just stops us in our tracks, we know that that's true and right and beautiful and that it's like very beneficial for us and we want more of it. Um, so, you know, I think that's a, a very interesting uh, phenomenon that's been studied and um, certainly a lot more that can be done. Timo, please. Well, that reminds me, I do a lot of astrophotography and I really love it. And the thing is, you start the night with just seeing slightly something. You, you let your camera shoot the whole night. Then you sit you take all these black pictures that doesn't mean much, put together, put your filters on, work one hour on an image. Then you see 1 billion stars on that sky. And, and that reminds you like, who are you? So like, you, you are, you know, it's like we are nothing com compared to what there is. And that all 
changes and but it makes also the life harder because you want to buy more gear so it pushes you again to buy expensive uh telescopes and all that. <laughs> but you are right uh once if you ever see michael jordan dunk and uh you think like wow so there are really people who do that it's uh, whenever i see those extreme things like really all inspiring things like the stars or the sun or i like clouds i like clouds a lot when i see the clouds getting really interesting shapes and colors i don't know what to, it's it's the best i feel and i don't really need anything else i mean i have a lot of stuff but i don't really any any of that if i can be on an island with no light pollution look at the stars at night and fall asleep that would be like the ultimate thing I, I agree. I was up in um, my horse's field the other day and I was looking, I was by this beautiful, huge, great oak tree. And I spent about half an hour just looking at the oak tree and it was home to so many creatures, obviously all the insects, but then things had been burrowing underneath, things were nesting in it. It was just a whole ecosystem in itself. And I think it's it's so easy, isn't it? There's a good old, some of the good old sayings are so important about it's the simple things in life that bring this happiness. But it's so, so true, isn't it? Because in terms of society now, Western society, we're the most affluent, you know, that we've ever been, but probably the most unhappy society when you look yeah. at all the problems we've got. And then when you take it back, and I'm not saying people who don't have all these things don't have their own challenges and i mean you know i've gone one day without water i do not want to be somewhere that hasn't got running water thank you that that would not make me very it would make me nervous which would make me unhappy but um you know there is a lot to be said for this this um relooking that we've all been forced to do over the last couple of years about what is really important to our lives you know like you started off saying the meaningful relationships is is and that meaningful relationship has got to start with yourself hasn't it if you're constantly unsatisfied with yourself you are going to be in a state of unhappiness and constantly unhappy with everyone and everything around you absolutely and there's something that i want to tie back with this catherine and, and what you had said timo so looking at the stars so this study the biological importance of awe uh stargazing was part of it and i don't have the exact words in front of me but they were basically saying how uh part of the way this was induced was that we could main that the person could mainstream the uh, entire cosmos or what we can perceive as the cosmos through the optic nerve and that we're, you know, self analyzing this. And it's really just this sort of like magnificent vastness into this incredibly small, tiny dot of the eye. And, you know, something that I would like to propose is as a question is, you know, if, when we're doing that, because we know that there's, very good scientific model showing how the brain uh, as it's mapped throughout its neuronal connections looks like stars in the universe and the cosmos. Mm -hmm. uh, are we as the brain and the perceiver and our through our eyes, are we the hologram perceiving the hologram in and of itself? That's a possibility. And it's not far off from a holographic uh, universe model, which is yeah, I don't want to go deep into that today, but um, it makes a lot of sense in, in terms of uh, prayer, wish, um, self-reflection. And um, there is a word that Catherine always uses to a manifestation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this all ties with the um, yeah, three-dimensional, two-dimensional holographic um, reflection of the three-dimensional reality and yeah, information theory and whatnot. But um, I think the, the bigger issue is, is just that the human is lost too much in the small detail of, of the daily uh, useless junk. It's mm -hmm. like, we are just so lost. I mean, I, I, I know it myself. There was a time, the first thing in the morning I would do is watch news 
Like this is the worst thing you can do to yourself because there is nothing good in the news. So why why you start with the day with your day with something so negative? Mm. Right? It's so, so true. And coming back to your point about the holographic universe and things, you see it at every level. You know, you look at the alveoli of the lungs. Whoops, I dropped my crystal. <laughs> um, and then you look at the a tree and you look at, you can see this in every area. Can't be like, you know, you put all the bits of fruit and vegetables and how they relate to different bits of the body that they're good for. Um, but also sort of going back to what you start what you were just saying Timo about what you start your day from I was reading some of the studies that show how much having too much choice in your life can cause a lot of micro stresses as they cause it that take you away from happiness and some very simple tools and techniques that people to remove the amount of choice they have in their lives um can actually lead to a much easier to have that space and the calmness to feel that contentment or happiness within you. So, for example, when we grow up, Timo, you know, there were three programs on television that you could choose from. Yeah, that was it. And now there's hundreds. And how many couples do you know that settle down for a cozy night in front of the sofa and it's ruined because oh, an hour later they still can't agree what they're going to watch? <laughs> That's correct. You know, well, that that's a classic example. So Tima and I, when we're talking about animals and about how much us humans, when we have animals in our life, take their choices away from them and how that can be a real source of stress and unhappiness for them equally. I think I read, I was listening to, I love Dr. Chatterley's podcast, they're really good. And he was saying that they've done studies that show there's something like 35,000 choices on average per day that people are just making on the most trivial things. Yeah, wow. and we call it in German Qual der Wahl. So Qual means torture, torture of the choice, choosing. Yeah, like it's it's a torture if you constantly have to choose. Qual der Wahl. Yep. Do you notice any of those techniques, Lance, for you in terms of taking some choices away can actually lead to a much greater state of calmness? Uh, definitely. You know, part of what I do... So this is one example, um, you know, with the supplement company that I own, Ascent Nutrition, uh, what I'm commonly doing is buying other products from other companies and trying them out. And if you would look at my counter, um, you would see a lot of different products. And uh, it's sort of one of those things where, I mean, yeah, you could take them every day, but is that actually gonna help you? Is it beneficial? Uh, the time commitment is another thing, but then what, what's most necessary, what's most important, and are all these choices just inundating? And, and they are, because mm -hmm. what I've found is when I can like clear some of them out and condense the, the amount of what I actually feel is important in, in a particular time, then I'll actually take them all or, or the ones that I'm focusing on. And if you've got all of them out all the time, it's just not going to happen. I think I, I notice that a lot, you know, it, it's why things like decluttering are so important for people as well, because when you're surrounded by so much stuff that everything's got an energy associated to it. And, you know, that energy can be very distracting. It can be very useful to you or it can equally be very distracting. I argue with my husband about this the whole time. He doesn't see the distraction of it. Me neither. <laughs> I do. That's, you know, um, I think most of the women listening will um, probably know where I'm coming from on that one. Um, so what about contentment versus happiness? What what do you think? Is there a difference between contentment and happiness? Start with you on that one, Timo. Not for animals. I see that from animal perspective, the happier they are happy when they really, really feel like in tune with their environment and they they feel accepted and a part of it so a dog that is disrespected daily uh, and totally neglected cannot be happy it can be happy for a moment if you show love but it's faded away the moment you turn your back and walk away uh, but animals who live with their environment really really in tune and feel like part of the society feel, feel like the perfect part of uh, their own um, life. They can choose what they want to do and they, they feel like 
their daily life is totally in tune in what they are, then yes, I think they are the same things, but not for humans. Because humans choose not to be happy when they are just uh, have enough. So people have an opinion about happiness. Most of the animals do not think about happiness. It's, it's not a big um, concept like we have. Like Lance said, it's not as straightforward. They are happy or not. Mm. But we think about it. So we make our lives hard by not accepting that having enough and having what you need is good enough to make you happy. We always think, but I need that to be happy. I want to be happy as that person. I want to be happy when I'm 80 years old. I want to die happy. I want to marry happy. I want to have a big uh, wedding to be happy. I, I, so it's like we are putting a total different twist to it. And sometimes we achieve it, sometimes we don't. But because we change the feeling and aura uh, about the word and its meaning to us, and I think uh, for most of the West, Western civilization, no, it's not the same thing. But for, for basic living people, uh, I think they are the same. Mm. What about you, Lance? Have you got any thoughts on that? Um, I, I really agree with everything that Timo said. I, I think you said it really well that if we're really looking at the word contentment from its truest sense and a, a person's being honest and they feel content, I, I think that they are very likely to actually feel happiness. Um, you know, there's a quote that I can't remember who, who said it, but you, you've both heard it and probably everyone listening's heard it too, that um, something like all of the world's problems stem down to the fact that uh, a person can't sit alone in a room by themselves. Okay. And uh, that's so true. And, you know, I know that all three of us have probably in our own ways had to go through that. And, you know, um, we're still all doing the work, of course, but, you know, when, when you really are in a situation um, where you are alone in your home and like, you know, you're going to be there for, you know, several hours or, or days or whatever it is that's going on. That's when, you know, your, your true self can come out in some ways. And, um, you really have to sit there and be with yourself. And, you know, that's, that's part of the issue with social media and the phones and the technology is that it's so easy to, to not do that and to just, all right, I'm just going to get on my phone and ignore what's coming up. I'm not going to be with myself. I'm going to just, you know, uh, distract myself. So, you know, clearly it's easier said than done, but the more that we can do that as individuals, I believe the happier we become because we realize that true strength comes from within us and that we can create our perceptions of ourselves and the world around us. We can create our happiness. We can create uh, the circumstances that we want in our lives and we can choose how we interpret those circumstances. It's so true. And I'm, I'm laughing a bit because it's a bit ironic going back to our conversation last week. Of course, we're never really alone because we are our own living ecosystem. So if you're ever struggling and you're sitting in a room on your own, just start talking to the bugs in your tummy and you'll be fine. <laughs> Don't call them bugs. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean. Your, li your little micro friends in there. We are never <laughs> truly alone. But I, I'm making a jest of it. But it is funny, isn't it? Because actually we're never disconnected, even if we're physically not with any other humans or any other lovely animals we're, we're always connected aren't we yeah. do you think before we get on and finish off with some of our top tips for for what we think you know um we've learned personally can make us happy i did want to just cover the fact of the fact do, do you think that a lot of humans associate happiness with excitement you know, so instead of like, if you talk to people about being happy, do you think a lot of people think you've got to be, you know, in an ecstatic state of happiness rather than a quiet, content stage of happiness? We'll start with you on that one, Lance. Uh, yeah, I, I do believe a lot of people think that. And, and I think that there's some truth to it. 
of course, you know, it, it's fun to, to feel excited and passionate about something if it's something that we like. Um, and at the same time, I don't think it's necessarily the state that we have to be in all the time to feel happy, nor do I think it's even good, good to be in that state all the time. Uh, I mean, clearly just from a physiological level, you wouldn't want to be, I mean, as far as I know, in that sort of uber excited state all the time. Um, so I think people do equate it with it. And I think there's truth to it. And I think that we can look at it from a different angle too. Yeah. I'm sure you'll have something to say about it with dogs as well, Timo. Yeah, but uh, I want to add it uh, because Lance talked before about dopamine and it connects to it again. So it's people uh, are forced or they are trained or they are motivated towards dopamine as, as the source of happiness, which it isn't. And uh, that's why you search for more and more and more for it. And once the, your receptors are full, so you are like empty shell of yourself, you cannot produce anything, you cannot do anything, you don't have even a normal conversation. Um, it's like you kept as an um, eternal teenager. Like mm -hmm. you, cannot, you cannot follow what you feel because now it's empty, you know, but you feel like there must be something, but there isn't. And that's, that's the sign of uh, uh, how we are living our lives totally, um, totally far away from what we need. Mm -hmm. So um, years ago, years and years ago, we have two friends in France, south of France. They're living in a very nice place. And they, they were not um, in tune in where they want to live because one of the couples wanted to live in Paris where they have culture in and out day in day out and the other one wanted to be at the Côte d'Azur have the fresh air have the nice trees and nice sunlight and the beach and and all around it the way it is so and this is a sign of one wants to be in tune with what he has and the other one wants to have input impulse constantly from outside and not happy with what actually profits uh this person right and this is a typical sign how we misinterpret what we need mm. to what we actually want because when wants become need and you you exchange them and misuse them suddenly you're never happy because you constantly want 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 because you feel like you need 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 and none of it is true like every every hiker every mountaineer tells you once the sky is on no lights around and you're under the stars that feels amazing and you sleep on a very thin sheet of rubber with stones underneath but that's your best sleep you had in the last several months so how is that happen suddenly you don't need your mattress you don't need your four walls you don't need your expensive car your ipad your iphone whatever you have and suddenly the only thing you have on your top the fresh air and the stars is totally enough to have the best sleep of your life and I think this is, we have to think about it more. Like yeah. we have to really put thought into it. Well, it's interesting. Again, you know, it, it's a good point. You know, you've still got young children. Mine are a bit bigger. But, you know, when, if you ask a four or five-year-old child, you've almost got to, something's got to ha that happen to make them unhappy. Their natural state yeah. is a state of happiness. And then something might happen that will temporarily shift them into a state of unhappiness. Yeah. But they're bounced back. So something's going drastically wrong <laughs> by the time we get to adults yeah. to shift the balance of that. And I think we've identified quite a lot of those things today. So how I wanted to finish off, both of you, is, you know, happiness we've had a long discussion about it but how to optimize happiness what have you learned in your journeys about personally some of the ways that can get you into um a, a state of happiness lance do you want to start with that one yeah um some of the happiest moments in my life are you know going back to seeking awe so watching sunsets watching sunrises i am consciously always seeking that sort of stuff out trying to see the beauty of nature uh and then additionally things that i've also included is um reading 
beautiful books that I love that are basically around self-help and self-development while listening to, uh, in particular, Claude Debussy. Debussy, interesting. Yeah, what about you, Timo? Well, I'm more of a caveman. So what I like is uh, <laughs> starry nights, fresh air, seaside, nice trees, some basic drumming, like really something, it can be really primitive or it can be extremely complicated but rhythmic things that, and I also love dramatic skies, look at the skies, I, the skies tell me a lot, I love it. And, but I think, again, we will we come, go back to the first episode, a true self-assessment is the true um, base for happiness. So knowing who you are, learning who you are is more or less, the most important thing to be happy if you feel really unhappy. If you are happy, then scratch that. Don't go deeper, <laughs> you will get lost. But if you are unhappy, you have to find what keeps you away from being actually who you are. Because again, if you can be who you actually are and you don't give uh, any uh, thoughts of how people imagine who you are or how people want you to be who you are, then just, um, yeah, look deeper, learn who you are and then be that person. I think that that's the, for me, the quickest answer. And I'm gonna go with both of yours because everything you said and also me, it's like when I look at the wonder of nature, you know, I mean, to me, the epitome of happiness is a guinea pig. As long as you're not keeping them in a hutch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but no, you know, in all seriousness, you know, you look at the beauty of nature. I mean, aloe vera plant, look how beautiful that is. Uh, so for me, I can switch into that state very quickly by um getting out in nature. I agree about the skies, I absolutely agree about the feeling of awe. Every time I look at another animal. Um, I only ever feel it when I look at humans that I say, like when I look at as someone who can climb a cliff and hang by their finger, that's all for me. I'm like, well, my body doesn't do that. There's so much that you can look at. And, and what I've done over my life is just cultivate each year a more of an environment around me so that it's easy for me to step in that. So I would find it very, very difficult to live in a city. So I've now reached a stage in my life where I can live out in the countryside so I can instantly, like you said, Timo, last week about climbing the trees, get access to that. So I think making choices in your life that make it easy for you to reach that state is, is really important. And you need what Timo was saying, is that awareness, that self-awareness of what makes you happy to do that. So... Well, I've loved that conversation today. I, there's, I've got lots to ponder about. Any final words from you, Lance? Um, I think that the more that we do to turn inwards and seek beauty outwards, uh, the happier we're going to be. And I think it's um, in some ways as simple as that. Timo? I go back to Einstein. Einstein says, if a busy desk is the reflection of a busy mind. What is an empty desk? <laughs> it's to refute the point of uh, being cluttered, being a problem. I see it as an, I see it as more of an inspiration. Yeah, and <laughs> I, I, I would say, look at our faces. I would say we are all feeling very happy at the moment. And for me, having stimulating conversations like this with friends, particularly when we've all got different ways of looking at things is, you know, certainly for me, expanding my consciousness to re remaining curious and, you know, putting some of these things, try and test and see what works for you as an individual. And please do let us know. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, both of you. And we will be back more time next week for some more fascinating conversations about optimizing your health and happiness thanks